about the love of God and what a tremendous love it is. To ask one of the great theologians of all time, what is the most of remarkable discovery that you've made in all of your studies? And he said, uh, Jesus loves me, this I know. Pretty remarkable, isn't it? Um, I'm going to ask Bob and Denise to come at this time, if they would. Uh, they would like to share a word at this point in the service today. As you know, in uh, June, I retired from teaching. And in March the 1st, is Bob's official last day he'll be retiring from trucking. So the plan has been for the last three years is to go to northwest Missouri to a little bitty town called Oregon, Missouri. It's about 800 people. And the joke in my family is the half of Holt County, that's the county Holt, that I'm not related to by blood, I am by marriage. I didn't know Arkansas was. It's not, no, no. Anyway, it's like a weeping willow. Anyway, we're kind of intertwined. So that is where my extended family is. We decided when my mother's health started getting bad, about three years ago we were commuting every weekend from northwest Missouri to southwest Missouri. Um, we were able to go to church. Bob's been able to get involved in the community that when it came time to retire, we wanted to go. We're not going to go south, we're going to go north. So I put the house on the market about 30 days ago, and be careful what you ask for, because we had a gentleman come in with a wonderful offer to buy our house, and this is our last Sunday in church. Uh, we wanted to thank you. We love this church, and we couldn't ask for better church family anywhere. And we really love you, and we are going to miss you. Dennis and Charlene, we think the world of you guys. You have been, in my life, some of the best ministers here mm -hmm. that I've ever had, and I thank you for that. Thank Bob you. and I thank you for that. Thank you. Ginger and Rich, we go to Wranglers for Christ on every other Saturday. We love that ministry. Thank you for everything you've done, and we are going to miss all of you. Now, here's the good news because I told a couple little girls this this morning. We're leaving my son, my daughter-in-law, and their two kids. And we are going to be active grandparents, which means we'll be traveling a lot. And I'll because be back trucking again. For the he's living out of the truck. He's living out of the truck for the next eight weeks. Um, we will be back. And when we come back down, we'll be here at Banner, and we'll be at Wranglers. So we wanted to thank you, and we wanted to say goodbye because this is where we need your prayers. The next three weeks, and if you, if you have nothing better to do for the next three Fridays, starting about 2 o'clock, we're loading trailers. So if you want to come and help, help is greatly appreciated. We are getting, I am getting in touch with Teen Challenge. We've used them before, and we're going to get in touch with them and ask them for help. We're going to be traveling the next three weeks from South Missouri to North Missouri. And we're also asking for your prayers as we do this, because as of right now, when I say be careful what you ask for, I'm homeless. <laughs> as of January the 1st, I'm homeless or I'm living with my folks again. That's homeless. That's homeless. <laughs> <laughs> Which means I go back to being a teenager, you know. But it's a good thing, so if you would please keep us in your prayers and that, first of all, the travels go safely, and second of all, that God has made this is a God thing. It really is. The gentleman that's buying our house, it's one of those things where he's moving home to be with his family. We're moving home to be with our family, or at least the greater majority of them. And so I have my full faith that something will happen in northwest Missouri and we will have a home soon. 
So that's what we're asking. We wanted to tell you goodbye and thank you for everything Banner has done and all the outreach that you're doing and all the wonderful things you will continue to do. And if you notice, I'm talking and he's not. And <laughs> we just want to thank you for everything and and we, that we love you. And when we come when we come down and make our visits, we will be popping in and seeing you. You won't get rid of us entirely. But thank you so much for everything. Amen. Well, we'll certainly miss Bob and Denise, and we wish them well. All right, this is the sequel. Uh, to last Sunday's message. Last Sunday, uh, I started a message that was entitled, The Fourfold Name of Jesus. And you may remember we covered a wonderful counselor last week. I introduced a new word, or at least a new word to me. I had never heard the word aptronym before. And if you'll remember, an aptronym is when your name matches your occupation. It uh, describes what you do, and I just thought of another one as I was just saying that in regard to Bob. Driver. I've known people with the last name Driver. Uh, if you recall, Dr. Bowser, of course, was a veterinarian. Uh, Roy Grout was a bricklayer. Dan Druff was a barber. Dr. Pullen, dentist. Otto No-Go, mechanic. Dr. Smiley was an orthodontist. Sonia Shears was a hairdresser. Dr. Whitehead was a dermatologist. Dr. Smelzy was a podiatrist. So that's an aptronym, when your name matches your profession. Well, Jesus' name matches who he is and what he does for us as Christians. He totally lived up to all of his titles. And I believe there are about a hundred of them in the scriptures. It takes that many just even begin to describe uh, the Savior that we call Jesus. Well, what good does it do to study the names of Jesus? Um, there, there are books written on the subject, the various names of Jesus, the various names of God, and what they mean. What good does it do to do that? Well, I was thinking, if you, if you were talking about a close friend or <clears throat> a brother or a spouse or whatever, and you begin to contemplate their qualities and you think they're faithful, honest, trustworthy, dependable, you begin to think about those qualities and it affects the way that you relate to that particular person based on those qualities. Or if you're looking for an automobile, for example, let's say that you wanted to make sure it had adequate power to get around someone uh, perhaps in a dangerous situation or you if a crash should occur, you want to you check out the safety features and you want to know if it's dependable and so on. And that affects whether or not you purchase that car. So the attributes of Jesus, as we think about them and as we meditate on them, really affect the way that we relate to him and the, the way that we relate to others in this world and the way we live and move. There will be times in your life when you'll need Jesus in different ways. There will be times when you need him as comforter. There will be times when you need him as counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. You'll need to relate to him in those particular specific times in different ways. It is good to know that Jesus is altogether lovely. He's altogether worthy. He's so great, as I said, there are over a hundred names and titles used to describe him in the Word of God. We're going to look at four today. Last week, as I said, we began uh, to look at that fourfold name that's given there in Isaiah chapter 9, if you want to turn there. Over 700 years before Jesus was born, this prophecy was given. 700 years. Isaiah 9 verse 2 said, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And Matthew referred to this particular prophecy in Matthew 4, verse 16, regarding Jesus as the light of the world. Verse 6 goes on to say, For to us a child is born. That emphasizes the humanity 
of Jesus. A child is born. He came into our world as a baby. To us a son is given. That emphasizes the deity of Christ. He always existed as God the Son. And the government will be upon his shoulders and he will be called. These are going to be his attributes, his essential characteristics. Number one, wonderful counselor. An exceptional, distinguished counselor with extraordinary prudence. This is the divine attribute of omniscience. Anytime you put O-M-N-I in front of a word, that applies only to God. God is the only omni. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He's also called mighty God, which means divine warrior. This is the attribute of omnipotence all-powerful. He's referred to as everlasting father or father of eternity. There is no point in time or space where he is not present. Think of that for a minute. There is no point in time or space where Jesus is not. Now that makes him a wonderful counselor. If you want to know what to do next, if you want to know what to do tomorrow, next week, or next year, He's already there. He can make an informed decision. He can let you know what is appropriate. And he's also the Prince of Peace, Shalom. The, na- the word Shalom indicates blessed prosperity, a condition of rich harmony and well-being. That's the fourth great divine attribute, omnificence. So there you have it. Jesus, 700 years before his, he was born, Isaiah the prophet was inspired to record these four attributes of Jesus, which also pertain to God the Father, God the Spirit, the Trinity. The fourfold name or title describes Jesus from four different angles, both human and divine. Robbie Zacharias, who I love to listen to on the radio, he said the son wasn't the son wasn't born. The son always existed. The child was born. The son was given. All right. At at this time of year when we focus mainly on the baby and the manger, I don't want us to miss the fact that that same Jesus, that same babe in a manger, is Almighty God who came to us and inhabited human flesh. Let's make sure we get the whole picture as we appreciate that babe in a manger. We call it the incarnation. Almighty God took on flesh and dwelt among us. That's why we call him Emmanuel, God with us. All right, just a word of review here. Last week we talked about wonderful counselor. It means a wonder of a counselor, glorious, exceptional, astonishing, extraordinary, jaw-dropping, awesome, amazing, astounding. You can use as many superlatives as you want to describe this counselor. That's the kind of counselor he is. It's all wrapped up in that word, wonderful. Psalm 77, 14 says, You're the God of great wonders. You demonstrate your awesome power among the nations. Psalm 16, 7, David wrote, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Isaiah 28, 29 said, The Lord is wonderful in counsel and magnificent in wisdom. He's a wonderful counselor. The question is, is he your wonderful counselor? When you have a difficult decision, when you're trying to decide which way to go, when you need guidance, where do you go? I hope, first of all, you go to our wonderful counselor. I hope you consult him in in prayer or, or in his word or godly counsel from some Christian that you trust. I hope you go to him no matter what the need. He's a wonderful counselor. John 14, Jesus said, I will ask the Father, he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. As believers, you know him, for he lives with you, he will be in you. He is in us today as believers. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus wouldn't 
invest three years in the lives of these men and women and leave them comfortless. He would not leave them as orphans. He said, I will come to you. The Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God is with us and in us as believers. And we have access to that wonderful counselor today, right now. You have a problem? Is there confusion in, in your life? Chaos? Is there a question? You don't know where to turn? He's right there. 24-7. Do you know him? Do you consult him? Do you turn to him as your wonderful counselor? So that's review of last week. Let's go to the next name, Mighty God. This name means divine warrior or divine, divine hero. It means powerful, valiant. Isaiah 11, 2 said the Messiah will have a spirit of counsel and might. So he is both wonderful counselor and mighty God. David asked the question in Psalm 24, 8, who is this king of glory? And he answers his own question, the Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. He has the power to accomplish what he wills. The Son of God is also God the Son. The baby born in a stable is also the king of glory. The humble carpenter of Nazareth is the architect of the universe. John 10, 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. He's a wonderful counselor. He is mighty God. And because he is mighty God, he can handle any problem that you are facing today. We used to sing a song in the youth group, bigger than all my problems, bigger than all my fears. God's bigger. I don't care what you're facing today, God is bigger. His grace is sufficient, always. And we can depend on that. We can go through life with that confidence, knowing that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. There is absolutely nothing that can come to you from the outside that is greater than the power within you as a believer. Your problem might seem large to you, but to him it's nothing. He healed the lame, the blind, the sick. He calmed the storm. He has control over weather. He has control over death. He brought Lazarus back from the grave. He rose from the dead himself so he can do what we might consider impossible in our lives today. He'll give you victory over whatever you're struggling with. Let him fight your battles as your holy hero. Worship him as your divine warrior. Praise him for his awesome power. Remember the words spoken to Mary, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing, no thing is impossible with God. I asked Jeff to sing. I got a couple of favorites that I ask for every year from Jeff and Misty. Jeff consented to sing that one of the all-time greatest Christmas songs, in my opinion, Mary, Did You Know? And I, I like to speculate as to how much Mary knew at that point in time. How much did she actually comprehend? And Mark Lowry has penned it so eloquently when he said, Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? Did you know this child that you delivered would soon deliver you? Did you know your baby boy is the Lord of all creation? Did you know your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb and that sleeping child you're holding is the great I am? The great I am. The one who stands outside of above, before, and after time itself. Did you know that, Mary? I think I might ask her when I get there. Did you know all that? That baby? He's the mighty God. Are you trusting in your own strength today, or are you trusting in your mighty God? That's the question. If you're trusting in your own strength, then you might come up short. I know I do. If I'd trusted in my own abilities, in my own intellect, my own strength, my own talents, I would come up short a lot of times. But he never will. 
Ray Pritchard put it this way. He said, uh, as the wonderful counselor, he makes the plans. And as the mighty God, he makes them work. Third title we have here is the everlasting father. The emphasis is on the word everlasting. It means father of eternity. Father of eternity. The Jews, when they used the word father, they meant originator or source. He's the source of time itself. The father of eternity. John 1, verse 1, describes it quite well. He said, in the beginning was the word. Of course, word is logos in the Greek, and it's Jesus, God's ultimate revelation to man, his ultimate communication in the beginning was the Word, Jesus, the creator of the universe, an ultimate revelation of God. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. That's Jesus, the everlasting Father, the Father of eternity, he always has been, always will be, in all places and times. He was not created, as some religions teach. He's co-eternal with the Father. Isaiah 57, 15 says, The one high and lifted up inhabits eternity. He lives in that realm. The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, he stands outside of time. He's the author of everlasting life. He's the father of redemption. As you see a babe in a manger, remember he's the everlasting father who cares for you with a fatherly concern. That must have presented some interesting issues for Joseph. What was it like raising Jesus? That's what I would like to know. What was it like being Jesus' sibling? Just questions that are kind of fun to, to contemplate sometime. Oh, yeah, Jesus never does anything wrong. And it would be true. <laughs> because he was tempted in every way, just like we are, yet without sin. It must have been interesting growing up in Jesus' house. Psalm 103, 13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Our third title is Everlasting Father. Our fourth title is Prince of Peace. Or it can be translated, the prince whose coming brings peace. The prince of prosperity, the giver of all blessings. Did you know that it could even be translated the tranquilizer? That's kind of an unusual translation, thinking of God as the tranquilizer. But he does give us peace, only it's a real peace. It's not some kind of falsely, unnaturally induced peace. It's real peace. I prayed with a woman last night at the hospital. Doctors are planning to remove her foot tomorrow. So pray for Diana if you would. She said, I have peace. She said, when they first told me, I cried a little bit, but then this peace came over me. And I said, I know exactly what you're talking about because I've experienced that same peace. It's a peace that passeth all understanding. It's a peace that the world can't give, therefore it cannot take away. It's a fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. And most of you have experienced it at one time or another. You're thinking to yourself, I should be freaking out right now. Why am I not? Why am I so calm and peaceful? It's because of the Prince of Peace. The Prince who's coming brings peace. And Jesus can give each and every one of us that peace that is untouchable. As the, God, as the angel announced Jesus' birth to the shepherds, there was a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Goodwill toward men. God's will for you today is peace. He wants you to be peaceful. He wants you to be calm 
and at ease. And that's a fruit of the Spirit living within you. When we were in Israel, we heard the greeting, Shalom. You probably heard it. Shalom is a state of wholeness and harmony. It's much more than hello. It's when it's used as a greeting, it's a wish for freedom from disturbance, an inward sense of well-being. So when you say shalom, you're wishing that particular type of peace, that sense of well-being upon that person. And you know, in a culture like that, while we were there, the Palestinians were lobbing missiles. Some 300 missiles, I understand, were lobbed in our direction while we were there. And so when you say peace, shalom, in that kind of an environment, uh, that's a great gift. It's the ultimate gift, the ultimate blessing to someone who lives in the midst of chaos. Number 624, God gave Moses these words to use when blessing his people. These words still apply to us. They are a benediction for us today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. That's God's will for you. That's his desire for you. Have you ever seen the Charlie Brown Christmas? I see some heads nodding. Charlie Brown Christmas. Did you realize it's been on TV for over 50 years? Jason Sarosky wrote an article <coughs> entitled, The Moment You Never Noticed in the Charlie Brown Christmas. I don't know if you noticed it or not, but I, I saw it this week. He said, Charlie Brown's best known for his uniquely striped shirt and Linus for his ever-present security blanket. Throughout the story of Peanuts, Lucy, Snoopy, Sally, and others all work to no avail to separate Linus from his blanket. Maybe you've had a youngster like that. Even though his security blanket remains a major source of ridicule for the otherwise mature and thoughtful Linus, he simply refuses to give it up until this moment. Have you ever seen that moment when Linus gave up his blanket? It's when he shares what Christmas is all about. He drops his security blanket when he utters the words, Fear not. Fear not. If you never noticed it, go back and watch it. It's there. I saw it. It's pretty clear what Charles Schultz is saying. The birth of Jesus separates us from our fears. The birth of Jesus frees us from the habits we are unable or unwilling to break. The birth of Jesus allows us to simply drop the false security we've been grasping to so tightly and learn to cling to him instead. The real source of true peace that no one can take from us. You know, the world of 2018 can be scary. It's scary when people are lobbing missiles at you. It's scary when the stock market's like this, if you have anything in it. It's, it's scary when Iran has nuclear weapons. It's scary when China is well on the way to overtaking us as the world's greatest economy and most powerful nation. You know, if, if your faith and trust was in things of this world, temp temporal things, material things, if your faith and trust was in the stock market or the economy or the military or whatever, then you might be tempted to fear. Well, as you know, the Bible says fear not 365 times. Once for every day of the year. It's not God's intention that we fear. He didn't give us a spirit of fear. In the midst of our fear and insecurity, this simple cartoon from 1965 continues to inspire us to seek true peace and true security in the one place it's always been and can still be found today. Because God took on flesh and dwelt among us, we can now have peace with God, that's the vertical, we can have the peace of God, that's the internal, and we can have peace with others, that's the horizontal. Peace. Ephesians 2.14 says, He Himself is our peace. 
So the question is, do you know him as your Prince of Peace? Have you given your anxiety to him? Do you know that peace that passeth all understanding? That's the question. I marveled last night as Diana said, laid there in that um, hospital bed. She's got congestive heart failure, and she's got kidney failure, and she's scheduled to lose her foot tomorrow. And she said, I have peace. And she was cheerful. She was upbeat. You see, the world doesn't give that. But the world can't take it away either. Do you know that peace that we're talking about? As I was typing, and this is no joke, this morning, this is what happened. As I was typing that very sentence, exactly at the moment as I was typing it, this text appeared on my phone from a number I don't recognize. Jesus said, I will give you peace. Do you know that peace today? That was the text. Is that spooky? <coughs> must be a God thing. It must be a message for us today. This prophecy was given 700 years before Jesus was born. The good news, we can experience him as our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting father our Prince of Peace, right now, today. Like the praise team saying, God loves you more than you can possibly imagine. He has arranged to deliver you from the bondage of sin as, and is offering you wonderful counsel, mighty power, perpetual peace. That's why Isaiah could say to us, not to somebody else, to us a child is born, to us a son is given. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his best. He didn't hold anything back. Why? So that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The baby in the manger is a personal gift from God to us. But a gift requires a response. If I put a gift under your tree, you may acknowledge it, you may admire it, you may thank me for it, but it's not yours until you receive it. The question is, will you do that today? Would you stand with me, please? <clears throat> 